Well, good afternoon. Um, I'm Merritt Jano, Dean of the School of International Affairs at Columbia University and a former member of the WTO appellate body. So it's a really a great pleasure for me to moderate this afternoon's discussion with five individuals who are really couldn't be more involved in the international trading system from very different perspectives and experiences. So we're entering into this conversation today on rebooting international trade in a moment when the external environment is experiencing a slowdown in the pace of trade growth. Uh, World Bank studies are showing that uh, trade is growing now more slowly uh, than the global economy, which is perhaps the first time in, in, in decades that this has been the case. But it's an extraordinarily active moment in international trade policy and negotiations. Uh, we saw a year ago a conversation of this kind here, uh, and we were congratulating Director General Acevedo for the conclusion of the Bali Ministerial and the Trade Facilitation Agreement uh, in the period since, uh, of course, the United States and India uh, have been able to come to an interpretation of the peace clause on food security that seems to have gotten that process back on track. Uh, there have been uh, further uh, substantial negotiations in the mega-regional negotiations, the transatlantic and the transpacific, uh, as well as other uh, regional negotiations uh, uh, involving uh, Japan, China, and Korea. Um, and of course, uh, a, a profound uh, conversation in the world about the relationship between these regionals and the multilateral system, and serious negotiations and consultations at the multilateral level as well about uh, services, plurilaterals, and uh, next steps in the uh, Doha development agenda. So I can't imagine a more expert group to engage this conversation today. And I just want to welcome you briefly uh, that we have the Director General of the WTO, Roberto Acevedo, uh, Frank Appel, Appel, excuse me, I'll call you Frank so I don't <laughs> abuse your name, uh, who is uh, the Chief Executive Officer of the Deutsche Post DHL and uh, broad uh, global experience as a company all over the world. Of course, Ambassador Michael Froman, US Trade Representative. Minister uh, Mohammed, who is the Minister of International Trade uh, and Industry of Malaysia. And Mark Weinberger, who is the Global Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Ernst & Young. So thank you all very much for being with us today. I think to start us off, I'd like to invite each of you briefly to share with us what is on the top of your minds with respect to how we could overcome existing obstacles and support inclusive economic growth by engaging the international trading system. And if I could invite Director General Acevedo to get us started. Yeah, well, thank you very much. And uh, I agree with you that these are very important topics in that uh, uh, we need to discuss them in depth. Um, the number of opportunities for the multilateral system um, to contribute to economic growth and, uh, and expansion of trade and uh, welfare in developing countries and developed countries is immense. Uh, right now we have several opportunities. Uh, let's start with the implementation of the Bali results. That's already a very big uh, outcome that we have before us. Um, let alone the results which are very important for the least developed countries that came out of Bali. Um, the trade facilitation agreement is emblematic. We're talking about an agreement that could inject into the world economy about uh, one trillion dollars a year. Its uh, estimates are of a creation of 21 million jobs around the world, 18 million of those jobs in developing countries. So that in itself, is, it, it, once implemented, is going to be a big boost. Um, we have uh, um, a mandate to finalize a work program to conclude the Doha development uh, round uh, by July. Not conclude the round by July, but to conclude the work program by July of this year. And if we do that, if we do that in a very specific way, very detailed manner, I think we would be uh, well positioned to conclude the, the round in a short period of time. Um, on top of that, we have a ministerial conference in Nairobi, 
uh, the 10th Ministerial Conference in December in Nairobi. It will be the first time that we're going to have a ministerial conference in Africa. The whole African continent is involved, is aware of the opportunities that the trade bring to them in terms of development, of social inclusion. So this is very important. And uh, we also have other initiatives that we're working on. We're working on the, uh, in, uh, and the expansion of the Information Technology Agreement, uh, which has, it's not fully multilateral, but the results of that agreement are multilateral, so they apply to everyone. Uh, and that is an agreement that uh, would expand the, the coverage by 200 uh, products, which would involve uh, amounts of around, again, $1 trillion a year. So it's a huge uh, 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 agreement uh, that we hope we can finalize um, this year. Uh, we're working on that as well. There are other things. We're working on the environmental goods agreement as well, plurilaterally. Some members are working on that, again, with a multilateral result. So even if the number of participants is not the whole membership, the results are applicable. So the liberalization is applicable to all 160 members. So we have a lot going on, and it's an opportunity to seize this momentum and uh, actually deliver multilaterally. Thank you very much. Frank, from your perspective. Yeah, so when, when I'm talking about that, two things always come to my mind, and that is peace and growth. Um, you know, being born and raised in Hamburg, Germany uh, in 1961, uh, you know, I lived in a country and was raised in a country which has, you know, you know, you know created the worst, worst and biggest war ever on our planet. And if you now look, you know, what free trade agreements have achieved, uh, I think the single biggest reason why this planet is a more peaceful planet is global trade and <coughs> connectivity somehow. Um, and on, in addition, what the Director General said, we can stimulate at the same time growth tremendously. So we do once a year a study which we call DHA Connectedness, and what you see there, you know, the most connected countries in the world have the highest human development index. Netherlands is the number one, and they have very high social standards, they have very little inequality. This is a very lib liberal, open uh, country. And you can see that, you know, other countries there are Sweden, uh, UK, uh, Germany, and that comes to growth. Actually, if you listen, look into the list of the top 10, all of them, you know, have shown tremendous resilience in the last financial crisis. And why? Because if you're open to others in any dimension, and we are measuring not only trade, we are measuring information flow, how many people are talking to other countries, uh, financial flow, what you see, you generate resilience in your country because you adapted to change. Free trade, open borders are creating, uh, you know, the pressure to change and adapt. And you are better prepared if a financial crisis comes than if it's difficult. If you look into the list again, when we are assessing 140 countries, you can guess where we have at the moment conflicts, many of them at the bottom of that list. Uh, because the people don't understand that the world might be different and conflicts are you're linked to that. And actually, the more connected the world are, is, and yet coming back to peace, you know, a business usually have not a tendency to destroy your own investment somewhere. So, and that's the reason why we have a different situation. If you have foreign investments all over the place, people don't want to destroy their own investments. And we see that in the current conflicts to a certain extent as well, that it doesn't escalate in some places too much because, you know, there is economic interest all over the place. So I think you know, these are two things I always think about. You know, the growth opportunity and globalization and open borders have been one, if not the most important driver of why this planet is a much more peaceful place than it has been. Thank you very much. Ambassador Froman. Well, uh, we're, <coughs> excuse me. we're approaching the trade agenda from the perspective of, very importantly, opening markets, furthering liberalization to promote growth, to promote jobs. Uh, to create good, well-paying jobs uh, for, our, for our people and create opportunity for them, but also as a way of raising standards around the world, whether it's labor and environmental standards, uh, whether it's strengthening intellectual property rights while at the same time ensuring access to, to innovation, um, uh, whether it's putting disciplines around state-owned enterprises to make sure when they act commercially, they, when, when they operate in the commercial world, they act on a commercial basis um, and have a level playing field with private firms, uh, whether it's to promote a free and open internet 
and the flow of information across borders. So we see these trade agreements, whether it's TPP uh, or TTIP, and I'll, I'll come back to the WTO in a moment, as ways to both to, to promote economic uh, growth and prosperity. Also, they have strong uh, strategic importance, bringing countries closer together at a time when there's a lot of geopolitical instability in the world. So uh, it's very much core to our economic strategy about promoting growth, creating jobs, um, strengthening our economy, but also uh, a key part of our overall strategic approach. The WTO is a critical part of that. Our pursuit of TPP and TTIP is all intended so that we can move forward on trade liberalization, move forward on raising standards and developing new rules in a way that's supportive, ultimately, of the multilateral uh, trading system. And we all know that multilateral trade liberalization is the highest and best form of trade liberalization. And I think the WTO is at a critical moment when uh, all the member states are, are, are looking uh, uh, at each other and, and looking at the Director General to determine, uh, can we take into account changes that have occurred over the last decade or two, uh, ways to how to incorporate those changes, whether it's the rise of the emerging economies and the kinds of responsibilities and, and obligations uh, that they should have to the international uh, economy, uh, but also new issues that are on the agenda that also need to be addressed. We wanna make sure we're promoting the development agenda, but there's a debate out there among developing countries about what is the link between development and trade. We see it in Latin America, where a number of Latin American countries have identified trade and investment liberalization as absolutely key to development, and others um, have gone in a different direction. So we need to have that debate in, in Geneva as well as it happening uh, around the world. And then we need to look at the whole agenda, the Doha Development Round agenda, uh, see where the countries are, and determine what is uh, the, the best way forward, what's going to be doable, what's pragmatic, what's realistic in order to move the agenda and the institution forward. Because it's very important from our perspective that the WTO be not just a dispute settlement mechanism, as important as that is, but also a mechanism for solving problems and for advancing uh, the uh, economic prosperity. And so figuring out what is the right scope of the agenda for moving forward, I think will be absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Minister Mohammed. Thank you, Merit. Uh, <clears throat> I, I do not claim to be representing the developing world, but uh, I'm the only one from this group of countries. I'm from Malaysia and uh, part of ASEAN. So let me uh, uh, talk a bit about the developing country <coughs> perspective in the context of obstacles. I mean, that, your opening words, you know, what do we see as obstacles? One can look at this from two perspectives. Uh, one would be sectoral, I mean, the issues on sectors, agriculture and others, that could be an obstacle. Uh, secondly, of course, levels of development, different levels of development. So, uh, of course, uh, Doha Round uh, is meant to uh, promote the development agenda, um, including the least developed uh, countries, uh, and um, to move uh, 160 countries together, of course, is, is, it, is a tough act, and uh, that's, why, uh, that's one reason why there's been many obstacles uh, in the last uh, 10 years or so. So that's my first point. Uh, and as far as obstacles are concerned, one can look from the point of view of sectors or where you belong in this uh, uh, development uh, ladder. Next, uh, let me <coughs> uh, say a few words about, I mean, I agree, Frank, I'm connected, and the Human Development Index or development, uh, the correlation between uh, uh, development and openness and connected, you know, connectivity, I think it's clear. I mean, uh, that's a given. I mean, no one would dispute that. But the difficulty is, because we have, we have all, we, all of us want to get the maximum, I mean, promoting our national interest. And in the end, it's a matter of uh, finding a middle ground, and it's difficult to find a middle ground. And all of us would like to get the best in any trade deal. Uh, and we all know uh, that uh, trade is good for us, uh, and it is a fact that uh, openness has resulted in a higher level of development and connected, uh, being connected, of course, as you say, Netherlands, you know, uh, the best in terms of hum human development index. We all agree with that. The, but the issue is, I am from ASEAN. I mean, we are 10 countries, and this year we're going to declare ourselves as a community. Uh, and uh, I just want to share with you the approach we have taken. Uh, it's a modest, uh, you know, in terms of a level of ambition, it's a modest, uh, we operate with consensus, uh, and that's why we've been able to progress. But we, we've been progressing 
in the area of trade, uh, partly because we have a modest level of ambition and we have a free trade agreement among ourselves. We've gone to um, Japan, Korea, China, and now we've got RCEP, which is Regional uh, Comprehensive Economic Partnership, 10 countries in ASEAN plus another six countries. And uh, in ASEAN, we recognize the centrality of ASEAN. It's driven by the ASEAN agenda. Uh, and uh, th that's why uh, we've been able to achieve a, a bit more progress. Uh, uh, finally, uh, uh, I would like to say a few words about, Michael has been talking a lot about modern high quality in 21st century. Uh, this is uh, an issue that, that of course, uh, US has been uh, talking quite a bit uh, in the last uh, four or five years. Uh, and this is uh, posing, again, talking from the developing country perspective. Yeah. Uh, we want to be a modern country, we want to be in the 21st century, we want high quality uh, and there are some challenges uh, and for a developing country of course uh, that's another, that, could not, can, that could be another obstacle in terms of achieving uh, progress. So I thought I would like to share with you some developing country perspectives including the ASEAN uh, and this year Malaysia is chair of ASEAN and we are uh, hoping to take a leadership position in achieving uh, uh, greater progress in the area of economic integration among uh, 10 countries and, of course, with our trading partners. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mark, may I off invite you to speak from your perspective of Thank you. Global Th Services Company? Yeah, absolutely, Mary. Thank you. Um, so you asked uh, quickly uh, two or three minutes challenges and opportunities. Um, I think the biggest challenge to trade agreements is politics. You know, we, we talk about the benefits of trade uh, to growth, and that's tremendous, and, and we all believe it when you study it, um, but that's diffuse, and the dislocation that comes with trade is specific, and that's difficult. Um, so I, I read the interest in the newspaper on the way down here, actually, about, you know, we're U.S. and Cuba starting to open up discussions about how to, to start doing more trade together, and I talked about how Cubans are very excited about having U.S. tools to be able to do more efficient farming. Well, there's a great example. Helps U.S. exports, helps productivity in Cuba, opens more markets, creates more opportunity, but that's not something that translates into just saying growth. So you have to multiply that times the opportunity you have by these bigger trade deals, and there's great stories. They're hard to get out there. So I think that's a challenge. We have great trade negotiators, great ambassadors. I have no concerns there, but we need to help them, the business community, to back that up. Second um, would be uh, what the minister talked about and ambassador talked about. The challenge is today's trade agreements are more difficult than they've ever been. Businesses aren't any longer focused on tariffs, quotas, and subsidies as the real problem. It is open markets. It is state-owned enterprises. It is IP protection. It is a whole bunch of issues that are barriers to investment um, that have to be dealt with to really open up the borders. Um, and so that's on the table. That's great. But that does, as the minister said, make it more complicated. And so it's harder to get multinational agreements when you're opening up all these issues. So that's another challenge. So now the opportunity. I think the regional approach has been terrific at getting domestic issues on the table in these regional agreements that hopefully someday will build to a larger global agreement. And it is easier to tackle in smaller bite-sized pieces, hopefully as a laboratory moving towards the more global agreements. And so I think the approach that we've seen and the progress, while we're not over the finish line yet on TPP or TTIP or anything else, has really given confidence again that we can get some of these things done and brought politicians, people to focus on it. So I think there's a real opportunity there as well. Well, thank you very much. Why don't we start a little, uh, our conversation really about the multilateral. Uh, and if I could invite Roberto, as you say that you see the period between now and June is a critical period uh, to really identify a work plan uh, uh, to, to really hopefully get over the finish line with some conception of the Doha development agenda. How do, what do you do between now and June? Well, I think the first thing we need to do is realize that um, we cannot just um, resume this conversation by getting the old instructions, you know, dusting the books and then reading, you know, from old positions. Uh, the world changed, really, uh, for the last uh, uh, six years and uh, certainly over the last 13, 14 years since the round started. Um, but what does that mean is that uh, we were converging, I think, until 2008. Uh, clearly, uh, the negotiations were bringing us to a, a kind of result that was manageable at that point in time. I was, at that point in time, uh, a negotiator. Uh, Pascal, who's sitting here, was <laughs> leading the process. He was the director general at the time. And I, we were approximating. But I think that at that point in time, and particularly after the financial crisis, we began to drift apart. 
I think clearly the reality changed. Um, and at that point in time, I think we began to have different types of sensitivities, different types of, of, uh, um, of, of policy decisions that now are a completely different, bring us to a completely different scenario. What we have to do now is look at what we have today and see whether what we have today in terms of sensitivities, in terms of uh, ambition, is compatible with what we were doing before. I think that we have to start that conversation. I think Michael made the, the point that we have to be open-minded, we have to be creative and, and be realistic and pragmatic about what can be done today. Mm -hmm. The worst case scenario for me is one of uh, immobility, mm -hmm. is paralysis. Um, that I think is the worst case scenario for the WTO and for the global system and for the economy, for the global economy. Mm -hmm. So let's be creative, let's be open-minded between now and July figure out where we are today, mm -hmm. what is achievable, and then engineer rules and disciplines and agreements that are compatible with that kind of uh, uh, landmark that we have established for ourselves. Mm -hmm. I think yours is one of the most difficult jobs in the world. <laughs> you have uh, 160 jurisdictions uh, uh, and, uh, and really a bully pulpit to convince. Can you give us a little more flavor of where you think there is more consensus than other places? Could you give us, a, or is this not the moment for that? <laughs> <laughs> Tough question. Um, I think we all consensually agree that unless we are engaged and unless we talk honestly about these things, uh, we're not going to go anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think that the more I talk to people, and I went to, to India just uh, last week and uh, to Cairo. I met with five different uh, ministers uh, from African countries. They all realize that we need to do something different mm -hmm. and that we need to be uh, ready to negotiate. Now, each one has a different perspective mm -hmm. about what we can do in agriculture, what we can do in industrial goods, what we can do in services, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but without the conversation, then clearly, Mm -hmm. We're not going to be in a position to establish what common ground could exist in each of these areas. And I, and I think that that's what uh, we have to do now, sit down and talk. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Well, you have someone sitting next to you <laughs> whose uh, 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 voice is, is significant in this process. Uh, Mike, can you share with us how you're thinking about advancing? And I, and I note that you've said very recently in the press Again, what you said today, which is we have to be realistic, we have to move this forward, it's been a long time in negotiation, it's really a time to act, and suggestive that if it doesn't move forward, you know, that you're thinking hard about what that means. So could you share a little bit more about your thinking? Well, I think for the, the health of the system, which we all care about, it's important that we do find a way uh, to move forward, and that's why kind of conversation that Roberto is referring to of having an honest, frank discussion about where the member countries are, are willing to go and where they're not willing to go. No country is going to get you know, backed into a corner to agree to something that, that crosses a red line. So let's have that conversation about where are our red lines, uh, where are our sensitivities, where can we take this agenda uh, going forward. I think over the last few years, there's been, uh, there's been a lot of creative thinking going on uh, in Geneva that has led to plurilaterals and you know, more honest conversations about fresh, credible approaches to moving uh, the agenda forward. And that's the kind of thing that, that, uh, that needs to crystallize now to determine how best to do that, how best to do that also in a way that's consistent with the development imperative so that we're addressing the development issues um, and how to make sure that the system moves forward in a healthy way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, uh, uh, no country is going to be forced to take on obligations against its consent. Mm -hmm. But nor should we allow one country to block other countries moving forward if there's a willingness and a desire to do so. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Minister Mohammed. what is your perspective about next steps in the multilateral process? Uh, multilateral, there are some challenges. Uh, uh, Bali, uh, there's been progress, but uh, some say it's limited. But, you know, something's better than nothing. So... Uh, we are very supportive of this process, building block kind of. You, you start small and you both do bigger things. Uh, what is important is, uh, I think, uh, to convince countries this is win-win. You know, I mean, developing countries develop countries, and that's a difficult part. I mean, where is the middle ground? 
And then this issue of uh, developed versus developing countries, least developed countries. There's got to be a thorough understanding of the need uh, to bring up the level of development uh, of the least developed countries. Well, there's been broad agreement on that, but when it comes to details, uh, we run up into, into some problems. So one is to convince uh, countries and in the end, of course, our people that it is win-win, developed and developing, least developed. The other will be um, this issue of small, medium enterprises that is going to benefit. Of course, we cannot possibly benefit everyone, but the, the vast majority of people, including small, medium enterprises, uh, will have to be convinced, uh, they need to be convinced that you know there's something in store for them. So the way forward is to strike a balance, uh, compromises, transparent, realistic, yeah? uh, and unfortunately, that, that has got to do with the level of ambition. We have very uh, high level, of course, in any, in any negotiation, but in some of these uh, negotiations, uh, I think over the years, we become more and more realistic, and uh, uh, in some cases, we've been able to find a middle ground. So that's a challenge, yeah, to convince uh, our stakeholders that it is beneficial, it's mutually beneficial, it's not a one-sided agreement. Thank you. This is a very diplomatic conversation. I'd like to... Uh, uh, I'd like to encourage our business executives. You know, business uh, hasn't always been that uh, encouraging of the Doha agenda, I would say. I mean, there have been periods when it's been hard to find business leaders really putting their weight into advancing. So I'd like to invite both of you. How, how resolute do you see support for uh, moving ahead on the multilateral uh, issues uh, which are very, ex you know, expansive, agriculture, services, uh, uh, tariff reductions, many areas. So where do you see private sector support to be most obvious and uh, uh, engaged? Um, yeah, sure. I'll start, Frank. You maybe correct me. Uh, I, I think um, I'm pretty confident that the business sector is, is, is very much behind it, um, but it's like you know either tax reform or entitlement reform, which is dealing with the difficult issues of, of sen you know paying for senior benefits. Everyone's for the concept, and then when you get to the details, it gets a lot more complicated. Um, and that's where you see, I think, business start to worry about um, splintering. That being said, so in the U.S., I sit on the business roundtable, um, which is the largest businesses in the U.S. Um, we have three priorities. Um, tax reform is one. Trade is the second, and immigration is the third. Um, there's a lot of other sub-priorities, but what we are convincing the businesses to do is to put aside our separate agendas for the benefit of overall trade. And what we see happening, how these negotiations are occurring under Ambassador Froman's in the U.S. standpoint, we believe there's real opportunity. And so you're seeing an excitement and optimism and a real desire to get something done, recognizing that there's going to be some people who won't agree with everything that's in it. But um, it's rare to get to the top of the agenda, and it's right up there. Okay, thank you very may, much. May, may let me add to that, uh, because you know what, you are right, Mary, that it has changed, particularly for small and mid-sized enterprises, from being, you know, it's dangerous for multinationals are coming in my market and take my business away to, due to the internet and the transparency now, this is an opportunity. So they say in the mid-size, when I'm talking to them as well, and smaller companies see that as a tremendous opportunity. So what I think the problem for the business is, that we are not vocal enough. We take that as a no-brainer anyway, you know, there's always good, and we are not strong enough to advocate or being ambassador for open markets and, you know, that we need common standards. And that's the challenge I think the businesses face is, you know, the politicians don't get enough verbal support, the wrong people saying it's all dangerous, jobs are going away, and it's the opposite. But we are not talking about that enough. So that's, I think, has changed from it's only for the multinationals, now the small and mid-sized enterprises see that as a big opportunity, but none, nobody is talking about that because we see it as a no-brainer. Okay, very good. Time to talk more then. Can I just build on, on Frank's point because I think it's very important. Uh, large corporations have the resources to navigate the complexities of the global economy. It's the small and medium-sized businesses that stand to benefit the most from these agreements, whether it's the trade facilitation agreement, at the WTO or TPP, where we're, we are specifically focused on small and medium-sized businesses, on e-commerce, which is the way that many small and medium-sized businesses engage with the international economy, or in TTIP, where a lot of the focus is on uh, trying to, to bridge divergences in the regulatory or standards regimes without lowering the level of protection in such a way that firms don't have to maintain 
two separate uh, production lines, that they're able to do products once or test products once rather than twice. They don't have to hire people in order to navigate multiple different sets of regulations. So it's really, in, in our country, we have 300,000 firms that export. 98% of them are small and medium-sized businesses, businesses with fewer than 500 people. And yet only a very small percentage of all of our small and medium-sized businesses export. And most of them export to only one country. So there's huge potential here if we can use these various mechanisms at the WTO, regionally, with Asia, with, with Europe, to make it easier and more efficient for these firms to gauge the, the you know, vast majority of the customers that live outside their country. And that's what this is really all about. And that's where a lot of the opportunity is to be created. Thank you. Well, if you don't mind, we'll shift now to talk about some of these regionals. You've started to mention them. And it does seem that there is a, a lot more energy focused on the regionals, and it makes one wonder if we have to get over at least some of them, reach some conclusion before you can really advance uh, the multilateral. Are they, and what is the relationship? How, is it, how are the dynamics between uh, the negotiation of the mega regionals and the multilateral? Uh, I note even here in, in Davos, uh, I've been to several sessions where we've had European leaders say that uh, uh, concluding the TTIP is, is, a, is a high priority and it, uh, seen as a really important uh, step uh, that could be taken uh, to stimulate growth without additional expenditures. Uh, that point uh, has been made several times. And I guess uh, you know, there's an expectation that the Trans-Pacific one is farther along than the transatlantic, that the coverage in areas are somewhat different, uh, uh, and of course, uh, the economies that are members of it are different. What is your sense, Mike, of where we are in the trans-Pacific uh, negotiations? How close are we? What's next? And uh, uh, how do we advance this further? Well, we are, uh, we are uh, quite far along in the negotiations. We are certainly uh, in the end game. Uh, which doesn't mean that uh, there aren't difficult issues still to resolve. The issues that are left are, uh, are, are, are um, uh, manageable in number, but the ones that are left at the end, of course, are always the most challenging, whether it's in market access or on the rule side. And we're working very closely with uh, Minister Mustafa and, and our 10 other counterparts to find landing zones, work through solutions, uh, consult uh, with our, our publics and our stakeholders and our uh, in our case, Congress, or in other cases, their parliaments, to be able to find uh, an outcome here that meets the high standard, ambitious, comprehensive objectives that we set out. So we're, we're very much, and, and as, uh, as, as uh, Mustafa would, I'm sure, concur, our, our teams are working uh, uh, very, very actively. Our leaders got together in November um, to discuss the, the timetable and the work program and we're all working very hard to, to reach a conclusion uh, there. Um, again, there are hard issues still left to resolve, but we're making very good progress. Mm -hmm. Minister, could you speak to this? It, do you see these as a, as a first priority, or do you see this as an equal priority to the WTO? Do you feel like this has got more momentum from your perspective? How do these relate to each other? Uh, we are frank and honest and transparent here. I think the, the problem, as you know, in the WTO is the number of countries, yeah, 160 is tough. Uh, so we've been stuck in the Doha for more than 10 years. And that's why in where I come from in ASEAN, uh, our priority would be ASEAN. Next, we say our dialogue partners, and now we're doing RCEP. But for us in Malaysia, it's not just the RCEP, it's the 10 plus 6. Uh, ASEAN countries plus Japan, Korea, China, Australia, New Zealand, and, and India, we are, we are 18 months in, into that. So that's a priority for all ASEAN countries, 10 of us. Uh, for, Mal for Malaysia and four other, three other countries, we are also in TPP. Uh, Brunei, Singapore, Vietnam, and Malaysia. So the question is, why are you in both? <laughs> I mean, firstly, uh, WTO, we, we are firm believers in the multilateral system but because it's not moving as fast, therefore it makes sense. I mean, we do not want to be stuck forever. I mean, we are, many of us are open trading nations. We are dependent on trade. I mean, if you wait for this, uh, this, this day uh, to, be, to reach the promised land, it's going to uh, uh, take a while. So for us, uh, ASEAN is a priority, RCEP, and for four of us, uh, we are 
doing uh, uh, TPP in parallel. So, of course, the first best would be WTO, yeah? uh, but to be realistic, because uh, uh, some of us might be impatient, yeah? uh, so that, that's why we are, uh, four of us in ASEAN are involved in both uh, the regional uh, as well as the uh, Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Hey, Mr. Acevedo, you have a challenge here. How do you reconcile, uh, how do you have the WTO play a role with respect to these regionals that you think would be helpful to the entire system? Well, the regionals are not uh, a novelty. Uh, we always had them, uh, and uh, we will continue to have them. In my view, they complement what we do multilaterally. They don't substitute clearly what we do. Um, for me, the most important is to reactivate the negotiations in the WTO. And people ask me, is, are the regionals uh, and these mega blocks uh, a threat to the multilateral system? And I, I, I always respond, no. Uh, the threat to the multilateral system is the WTO itself. If the WTO does not deliver, that's the biggest threat that you could have. So we have to begin to um, uh, deliver results which are meaningful and which uh, are of significance to all, all members. Um, I think these regional agreements, in fact, are helpful because um, I said today uh, in an interview, uh, the trade liberalization is contagious uh, because it's about a frame of mind, it's about a set of policies. And to the extent that you have uh, important players and important, uh, an important number of countries and regions involved in trade liberalization, it helps the, the, the environment in Geneva and it inspires the negotiations in Geneva. What we have to figure out is how to take account of the different realities. We are actually 160 members, um, but I don't think that we are, we are where we are because of the number. If we were just 12 members, we would still be in the same situation because it is deep uh, differences between the core group that are paralyzing us. If we figure out how to bridge those differences in the core group, I think you can multilateralize that conversation rather quickly. So I think there is a, a potential for synergies between the, the regional agreements, these, uh, these free trade agreements, and the multilateral system. They do not fight against each other. In fact, they could be helping each other. Okay, thank you. One of the things I, I have heard Ambassador Froman say and, and, and others uh, involved in, in these negotiations uh, uh, is that they go farther than the WTO, that they're representative of deeper integration, they're more responsive to uh, the economy today than the Uruguay Round Agreements, which are already uh, now um, uh, 14 years old. And, of course, one of those areas uh, has to do with supply chains of relevance uh, to your, to your uh, sector. What does deep integration look like, and how is that, uh, do you see that being engaged by these uh, regional arrangements? Yeah, I think deep integration means that, you know, the whole discussion is not any longer about duties and tariffs. It's really about standardization. I, I think we have the opportunity at the moment, in particular in the TTIP, to create global standards, which is beneficial before the world starts to develop new standards somewhere, because we can't agree and we have different standards in the US and in Europe. I think we should use that. And that means then if we really standardize the world on certain, in certain industries, that really creates a deep integration, because then it, the products are serving the same purpose with the same specification. And that is uh, what I think is deep integration. It's not just tariffs and duties, because that's not the issue between the US and Europe. Mm -hmm. You know, that's marginal anyway. And it's probably also becoming less and less important for uh, multilateral negotiations. It's much more the standardization of and the red tape, which is still linked to and is actually waste. Yeah? You know, red tape is waste. If you have that, take it out. You can reinvest it into in other <coughs> stuff for more growth, infrastructure, education, whatsoever. So I think deep integration for me is really that we are agreeing on common standards, and if we do so, then we create global standards, and if we do that, I think then everybody can benefit from that. And that can be then translated later on as well in multilateral standard, standardizations and, and multilateral agreements. Mm -hmm. Mark, would you care to comment on that? Do you see that occurring in your industry? Yeah, absolutely. So you take, you know, one of the most important things for us is consistent regulation. 
Um, we can't operate in 152 countries under different standards consistently, and our clients can't either. So some of the debate around whether you want to have, you know, mute, you know, harmonized regulation or re mutual recognition, that debate's happening now more, and I think that's appropriate. And hopefully that will expand to multinational level, and we'll learn from it at the at the regional level. These are the issues that are at the heart of really, in in our view, impen, uh, inhibiting. Uh, cross-border investment uh, and cross-border ability to share data. You know, you got the privacy issues, you got the e-commerce issues. All these things are now on the table, which is the good thing. The hard thing is now that you got to solve them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that is precisely the challenge that we have today in all these different agreements, in all these different negotiating fronts, because while the tariffs are, um, let's say, easier uh, to handle, because you're talking about preferences which are negotiated there, um, the discipline-making side of those agreements is much more complex because at the end of the day, you're going to be creating different standards and these standards will may be more difficult and more costly for businesses to meet these different standards than if they had a harmonized global uh, uh, situation. So what we hope would, would happen, and, and this is something that we are already beginning, we're starting a, a, a study in the WTO uh, and it's difficult because these agreements are negotiated in confidentiality, so we don't have all the information. But some of it is out there, so we're trying to see how compatible they are, how, how, how compatible they are with each other, and what kind of improvement, what kind of challenges they would pose to the multilateral system and to the rules that have been negotiated globally. So that is a very important contribution, I think, that the WTO can make, which is, at some point in time, serve as a harmonization of standards uh, which would actually make uh, the waste uh, be minimized. Thank you very much. Ambassador Roman, could you comment on, on this in the sense that has that really granular work been done to identify, you know, sector by sector where the differences lie? Say, let's take the transatlantic context and how to, how to work through those because they're very internal matters uh, and, uh, uh, you know, we've, we've, we've done this, we've tried this at different periods. It's not a new idea to have mutual recognition, and, and they've really had difficulty moving ahead. So what's different now, and has the granular work been done to advance this? Uh, we're, we're in the midst of that, I'd say, and, and we're approaching it in a couple different ways. Let me take the regulatory side. We're looking both horizontally at regulatory process, and that's really about future regulation, so that we're, as we look ahead, have the best possible regulatory practices that hopefully can avoid unnecessary divergences going forward. And then we're looking sector by sector in a number of, of key sectors. Um, but it's a very, that process is a very uh, labor intensive, data driven process because none of us want to lower our health, safety, or environmental standards. None of us got into this negotiation to, to lower standards. And we're both, all of our regulators on both sides of the Atlantic um, are, um, uh, have done very good work and are uh, committed to maintaining high levels of, 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 uh, of protection. And so the challenge is, can we find ways of bridging those divergences without lowering the standards? And that is a very, um, uh, as I said, data-driven, labor-intensive process because we want to make sure we understand exactly what the data is to demonstrate whether a, whether a regulation is equivalent uh, or not, a safety regulation, for example. And it takes an enormous amount of effort to determine whether there a particular regulation uh, can produce an equivalent level of, of safety. And we're committed to doing that at the same time as we look horizontally towards improving the overall regulatory process. Thank you. We have enormous expertise in this room, so I think uh, we should invite you to ask your questions. If you could please identify yourself, ask a brief question uh, f uh, to our speakers, and if you wish to direct to a particular individual. Sir. Uh, please identify this yourself. This is David Sirota with uh, International Business Times. This is for um, the director or Ambassador Froman. Um, the EU recently put out a full text of its uh, offer of an, uh, of an agreement uh, in negotiations with the United States, uh, the full text for the public to see. Uh, there have been critics who say that hasn't happened with the uh, uh, TTP, uh, and I'm wondering um, 
whether the EU, if you believe the EU is right or wrong to put out the full text of their agreement and not have the text of the TPP out, or is the United States and its trading partners correct in not putting out the full text of the TPP? I, 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 would anyone like to answer that before Ambassador Frum? Look, I, if anybody before me, please. <laughs> please. Look, I think um, uh, it's very important that as we pursue these trade negotiations, we do so in a way that takes into account input from uh, the public, from our a wide range of stakeholders, from our political processes. In our case, uh, Congress, we work very closely with Congress. We each have uh, different ways that we engage in that process. Uh, for example, in the US, uh, we work, there's probably no area of policy where there is closer collaboration between the executive and Congress than trade policy. And just as an example of TPP, we've had more than 1,600 briefings in Congress on TPP. And that's a key part of a process because every proposal we put on the table in TPP is previewed with our congressional committees of jurisdiction. They have input, they have feedback. Also in the US, Congress created a series of advisory committees that include small businesses, local and state government officials, uh, every major labor union, environmental groups, consumer groups, healthcare groups, development groups, faith-based groups, and they all review our proposals before we put them on the table. Um, and so we've each, and then we have stakeholder events where we invite them to our negotiations to present to our stakeholders, not just to our negotiators, not just our negotiators, but negotiators from all of our countries. We put out on our website, for example, in, in the case of the US, we put our equivalent of our mandate, our negotiating objectives for, for TTIP, uh, as well as TPP have been on our website for, uh, for over a year and a half. Um, uh, we put out uh, summaries of, of the negotiations. We put out blog posts on particular issues. So we're trying to find ways, and we can always do better, on transparency. We're trying to find ways to ensure that we get that we get the input of a wide range of stakeholders and from our public and from our, um, in our case, our, our Congress, while at the same time, we're negotiating uh, an international agreement. Um, and that we are, will continue to work on this issue um, of transparency as we move forward. Thank you. President Zadio. No, what? Another one. <laughs> <laughs> no, Ernesto Cedillo from Yale University. Uh, well, I think uh, first, congratulations, Mr. Director General, for what you have achieved for the last year. But it seems that uh, the organization is still under the heavy burden of the Doha round. And I speak as a, an initial great enthusiast. I was, uh, one of my first pro bono jobs, which I have had many, was to be advisor of Mike Moore and try to help to launch the, the round uh, in that capacity. But uh, then 10 years ago, when Dean Jano invited me to be part of a conference, my article or my chapter in the book was uh, how to save the WTO from the Doha round. And that continues to be seemingly the relevant question. And I say this because three or four years ago, I think in this room, uh, Peter Sutherland and uh, Jadish Bhagwati presented a report that had been commissioned by the government of Germany and I think also the government of the UK, where they basically said, well, there are two options. Either we conclude the Doha round with a minimum package or uh, heads of government should instruct their ministers uh, that if by a certain date we don't have the round concluded, it should be declared death. Uh, do it or don't do it, but say that you don't want to do it. And again, I think we are moving into a, a, a process that could be very traumatic for the organization. You said we need to conclude the work program. Actually, the Doha round was called work program. <laughs> Uh, so we are back to square one. Uh, how could you be mandated or the general counsel to say, but certain date we haven't made progress? Forget about the Doha round. We have many other things to do, first and foremost, to protect the organization, which is a great, one of the best organizations in the multilateral system, and move to the new issues and to the old issues, but with a different approach of governance of the WTO. 
there are advocates of all different uh, trends and colors that you can imagine in an organization with 160 members. This conversation has happened. Uh, some members have uh, suggested precisely that. Uh, others say, look, how are we going to move on to new issues if we haven't even figured out the old issues? Uh, and some of the issues that are on the agenda are very important. Uh, and the, and some of the issues which are holding back the agenda, some members do not want to give up the discussion on them, one of them being agriculture. So they are very reluctant to give up uh, a discussion that involves these issues, critical issues for them, for example, agriculture, and move on to issues which would then uh, sweep all of these uh, problems aside and move on to a completely different agenda that doesn't uh, give them an opportunity to solve asymmetries, to solve uh, uh, concerns which can only be addressed if these issues are on the table. So even to give up on the round, you need consensus. <laughs> Otherwise, you still have it there. And I think what we have to do at this point in time is to be realistic about what can be achieved. And if at the end of this conversation, members feel that this is unachievable, then they have to handle that. They have to square the situation head on. And they have to face the situation head on. And they will have then to decide, what do we do? If we are facing something which is unachievable, then what do we do? I don't know, I don't have the answer for that, but they will have to answer that question somehow. And I think that that's part of the conversation. Anyone else on the panel care to comment on that? No. Other, over, over here, please. Thank you, uh, Terry McGraw, McGraw Hill, and uh, and, and uh, International Chamber of Commerce. Uh, first, thanks to all of the panel uh, for your comments, and uh, two quick comments, and uh, then two quick questions. Uh, uh, comment. I loved your comments uh, on what business leaders need to be doing in terms of communication, uh, and, and uh, we don't do enough uh, in, in terms of that. We've got to, through our organizations like Roundtable and International Chamber of Commerce and like, we've got to make sure we're doing that, uh, you know, loudly and clearly. I would also say, from a media standpoint, uh, the media doesn't do a very good job because I don't think they think the general public uh, really cares all that much. Uh, and, and so they don't uh, do that job. And Mr. President, uh, and I, I can't believe you of all people made the comments you made. Uh, and, you know, for Doha Development Agenda, it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. Uh, and, you know, right now we are seeing some of the greatest momentum uh, that we have ever seen. Uh, we're not talking doing a lot of uh, bilateral free trade agreements. Uh, we are now talking uh, you know, some very, very serious issues of breaking down the Doha development agenda and building it. So I think that we're on a roll at this point, and the momentum that we're seeing uh, is something to build on. So I think the fact that we've got trade facilitation uh, at this point and soon to get Trade Pacific, uh, you know, completed is going to give TTIP, it's going to give the International Trade Agreement on Services and IT Agreement a lot of push. Uh, why aren't you doing more uh, on that one? Two quick questions. Uh, and, uh, Director General, uh, you know, in terms of trade facilitation, in terms of projections and looking out, uh, in terms of the implementation of that, we talk about a trillion dollars to the world economy and 21 million jobs. Uh, and, you know, what kind of implementation uh, and how long is it going to take to be able to realize, uh, in your opinion, some of those kind? Uh, and, and Ambassador, uh, in, in terms of trade uh, Pacific um, partnership, uh, and, you know, uh, the question now is, uh, because uh, some of us optimists think that uh, you've done such a great job that uh, uh, this is going to pass real quickly. Uh, and, and so I'm talking about the rest of 2015 and getting into 2016. Who else has to come into this? Who's not going to, or who's going to be disadvantaged if they don't get into it? We've, we've heard about Korea and uh, Philippines, Indonesia, but who else? Uh, and, and how is this going to expand? And how do you look at China, uh, especially hosting the G20 next year uh, and their involvement with TPP? Well, uh, we have more questions than time. 
and uh, we have uh, promised our panelists that each gets uh, about a minute uh, to conclude, uh, to leave this session with their parting thoughts, and I invite you to fold these questions into your responses. But as we leave this discussion today, what, we, what would you like uh, all of us to be thinking about, about the next steps in the international trade uh, regime and how to advance it forward? Ed, start with uh, Mark. Well, sure. I'll talk about the things that I can control as opposed to the hard issues that they have to negotiate, which is uh, along the lines of the comments you've heard and, and also that uh, Frank said earlier, which we in the business community need to help in communicating in a way that people understand the benefit of trade, that it is growth. We won't have growth without trade. And we have to be able to make the case in a way that the average citizens can understand, both in developing and developed markets, because it's going to take two sides. I think we have the capability to do it. We need to focus and get it done to support our negotiators. Thank you. Minister. A couple of points. Uh, firstly, <coughs> I agree that uh, regional and mega regional complement what uh, uh, you're doing in, in WTO, and we have to move in tandem, in parallel, I think is a very important principle. Uh, I think we cannot abandon WTO. I mean, uh, it's, it's so important. At the same time, regional should go on. That's point number one. Point number two, I think going forward, issue of standards and, and, and issue of uh, uh, trade facilitation, these are very important issues. Uh, uh, in our part of the world, uh, we've been focusing a lot uh, on, at the border issues. It is a very interesting in multinational with EY and uh, Doshia Posia. Uh, although we have different standards, you know, uh, different regimes, you operate in more than 100 countries, and yet you're able to, to, to not only to, to, to do well, but you're able to survive. I mean, you know, what I'm saying is that there appears to be this anomaly. On the one hand, you say you've got so many different standards, cost of compliance. At the same time, you're, able, you're doing well in all these countries. So it is interesting to see why is that so? I mean, it's just a, a question that I, I think is very, very important to, to look at. Yeah? Uh, standards are important, trade facilitation, and some of these things have been driven by EY and Dr. Post and others. Yeah? Thank you. Thank you. That's your friend. Well, I, I just add, uh, perhaps, uh, one way these regional agreements can continue to build momentum uh, for the multilateral system is I think they should be considered, at least in our view, open platforms to which other countries who can meet the high standards that they establish uh, can potentially accede uh, with the consent of all the, with all the parties. And that, uh, as, as, uh, as uh, Terry and others have alluded to, there are other countries that have actually expressed interest in joining TPP after the 12 of us are done. Uh, there are countries who have already expressed some interest in potentially joining uh, TTIP uh, once uh, the US and the EU are done, and I think that's a positive thing for socializing some of the new rules, some of the new standards on a, on a broader basis. Uh, with regard to China, just to, to answer Terry's point, I think our, our focus right now with China is very much on the bilateral investment treaty that China has uh, ag agreed to negotiate on the basis of a negative list and, and, uh, and pre-establishment. And that, I think, uh, will uh, be a, an important exercise for fleshing out um, how China intends to pursue the very ambitious reform program that its leadership has announced, and we look forward to engaging with them. We've had a good year of negotiations for the last year. We've made a good progress working through uh, the basics uh, of the text, and this will be an important year as we engage uh, in, the, in the negative list uh, development uh, and in the other issues that need to be addressed. Thank you very much. Director General. I think our conversation today made clear how important a role the multilateral system can play uh, and what kind of impetus it can give to the global economy when, at a moment when it's sorely needed. Um, and I would say that we are facing uh, a big opportunity here. This members are beginning to be open-minded. Beginning, we're beginning to see traction in the conversation. And that will require involvement, and that will require involvement at the highest level of people like the officials that we have here in this, in this panel, uh, ministers. So there will be tough political calls, and, and I, we need that kind of involvement, that kind of, uh, of attention to what we're doing now in Geneva, and I hope that that kind of engagement will come. Um, in answering the question about uh, the trade facilitation agreement, um, first of all, thanks the International Chamber of Commerce for all the support it has given to the multilateral system and for the negotiations. It's, it's precisely that, what we need now to get things done. Um, 
trade facilitation agreement is being implemented. Uh, we are already receiving uh, letters of acceptance, so members now have to go through their ratification procedures domestically and accept the agreement. We need two-thirds of members to get the agreement in place. Uh, we're beginning to see that, and uh, a critical part will be support for technical assistance to developing countries, and I hope that the private sector and the donors will be um, uh, forthcoming to, to, to make this happen as soon as possible. Thank you. Yeah, I think we are currently in a, in a historic chance because we have TPP, we have TTIP, we have a TFA on the plate, and and you know, looking to the facts and figures, you know, the list of countries who have uh, been successful with protectionism is empty. There's not a single country you can uh, mention which has been um, you know successful without open markets. So I think we have an historic um, a chance. You know, I'm coming from Hamburg, which has one of the first. Or, um, trade agreements in the Hanse ever uh, on this world, and I'm a basic believer in that, and I think we all should play, uh, an, you know, advocate or ambassador role to convince people we can influence. You know, that means for me, you know, traveling around the world, I always talk in town halls about TTIP or TPP because I think that's important, and TFA, and we all can do that, whatever we do, I think, to, to use that opportunity and, and take that chance we have at the moment on the plate. So that would be my wish from, from that session, that all of you are influencing the people you can influence to, you know, to support that we get these free agreements really through. Well, thank you very much. I think uh, any good conversation leaves you hungry for more, and I certainly am uh, hungry for much more. So many subjects we could engage in much greater depth, but please join me in thanking our panel for being with us. <laughs>